A lot of nutrition therapy plays an integral role in the prevention and treatment of the type 2 diabetes mellitus. Now, the question is why diet alone can't treat of this diabetes mellitus? Because you know, there are a lot of food flaws, there are a lot of dietary flaws that is also involving but controlling diabetes. Because you know, if you talk about the bioavailability, if you talk about the absorption, if you talk about the other nutrients, because there are a lot of nutraceuticals, lot of pharmaceuticals nowadays are coming up, and this giving a very holistic approach to all the nutrients. Because they are starting from vitamins, starting from minerals, starting from you know uh, like L-carnitine, starting from inositol, myo-inositol, lot of variant nutrients and lot of extra nutrients that we can get because it's normal diet why we're missing because due to the cooking process or due to the cooking mechanism or reheating because if, if you have in a, a given point of time you're having tea then tea contain maybe the tea contain good amount of catechins and a green tea contain good amount of epigalato catechin gallate but during the you know too much of boiling of the tea and also adding that too much of milk too much of sugar basically destroys the important nutrients like epigalactocatechin, gallate or catechins to our body and we are increasing lot of you know the anti-nutritional factors like lot of tannin, lot of tannic acid, lot of caffeine that can be retained so this, this, this shouldn't be done that should be properly we are getting the actual antioxidant or nutrients we are supposed to get so this is something basically this breaks the gap between the food flaws and the food the gap we are getting from the daily diet and these nutraceuticals or diabetic specific formula actually help to bridge the gap between a holistic approaches to make a proper diabetic specific diet. And it's not only a diabetic specific diet, but also the other comorbidities like diabetic cardiomyopathy, diabetic nephropathy, diabetic retinopathy, there are a lot of a diverse role. Because if you talk about the lutein and zeaxanthin, a very good you know, precursors are getting from the vitamin A. So this will uh, we will get from any kind of specific formula. Maybe our kalojam, jam, will predominantly this kind of fruits are available in West Bengal. We are getting, but due to the again the bioavailability, all the you know the food timing, freezing, refreezing, all things, we are not getting the actual antioxidant nutrients we supposed to get. So type two diabetes mellitus a risk factor. What we have said earlier, and what are the core principle for the type two diabetes mellitus? and also the nutrition management because medical nutrition management should be catered by a qualified dietitian it shouldn't be like from the internet shouldn't be like from you know uh, like any other neighbor shouldn't be like than a proper lot of because in internet if you search there are hardly we can get a authentic site because we are basically try to emphasize to build the authentic sources it's not like because google anybody can write anything but that not the sources. We are maybe we are suggesting about the East Spain guideline or the Aspen guideline or the NIN guidelines or any kind of guidelines basically published in the public index journal. And that should be the key for maintaining for our nutrition guideline and that should be catered because all my uh, dietitian and qualified dietitians, colleagues, senior, juniors, all are there. You, sh you should agree with me because that should be catered because diet prescription should be right. This is not a diet chart. What I said also before, diet chart means one a single copy, like 1200 calorie, 1400 calorie, 1600 calorie for everyone. But that is not done because you know in our hospital, like if you talk about the KPC Medical College, so first once a patient is admitted, we try to go for the mast or any kind of tool that is maybe the sarcopenia or hospital. Uh, you know there are a lot of protocol that we have to follow, and there are also the ABCD method, a lot of methods. According to the method, we have to give a diet prescriptions. Maybe patient is suffering from any diabetic disease, but same 1200 calorie printed diet chart is not for everyone. That should be customized, that should be properly calorie calculated, disease specific and also the drug nutrient because maybe Dr. Pal is there, maybe there are some drug is going on. So what kind of drug is actually the contraindicate with the particular nutrients? Maybe he has written acetrome. Or he has written any other particularly you know the antiplatelet or anticoagulant drug so there should, should be a vitamin k restriction so if you don't follow our physician this is a 
holistic approaches between a physician, a specialist, a clinical dietitian, nurses, and all the other stuff. Otherwise, you can't give a proper diet prescriptions to uh, any patient. So that should be number one. Number two, recommendation of dietary supplementation, nutraceuticals that benefits because you know di diabetes is depends on the di obesity. So obesity, if obesity is not controlled, there is again the insulin resistance is there. If insulin resistance is there, diabetes could be there. So it's all about the GIP, GLP, I mean coming to that part. So that is all related because too much of glucagon secretions means high diabetes. So how do you control about the glucagon secretion? How do we control about the glucose uh, forming in the liver? So that is the main key factor and there are a lot of, you know, the nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals are coming up to bridge the gap, what I have said you earlier. Synchronizations of carbohydrate with insulin secretagogues, with the sulfonuria, because again there are a lot of medicinal interventions. Because predominantly we, if you talk about the remission diabetes, because there are one consensus from the American Diabetes Association, within the 6.5 percentage of HbA1c, we can do the remission like reversal of the diabetes mellitus. So we can try to maintain with the proper clinical diet prescription, then we can try to remission of this particular diabetes to the reverse reversal way. Because we know the laboratory range is 70 to 110 for the fasting and 80 to 140 for the PP. But if there is also term is the impaired fasting or impaired glucose tolerance, till 126, uh, any physicians, any doctors can wait after that, this patient is unable to do, patient is reluctant to do, then they can start the medicine. Maybe they are starting with the bigoanoids. Maybe they are, in the bi because we know that the roles of bigoanoids, that they basically the reduce productions, you know, too much of glucose in the liver and followed by the sulfonuria and other insulin secretogogs in that their GIP, GLP functions are there. There are recent studies says there are may, a minimal weight gain after the sulfonuria, very rare, but the bigoanoids, predominantly are the weight reduction. So that is for the weight reduction. So these drugs and there are a lot of other drugs like TD4 inhibitors, syncretin mimetics, like alpha glucosidase, uh, I mean, a lot of other drugs. I'm not going to that part, but that is also the management of the diabetes. So specific considerations while planning the diet in diabetes. So you have to all the calculative way. Diabetes, there, there are a lot of, you know, again the food flaws or dietary flaws is there. If I am suffering from diabetes, that means I have to restrict the carbohydrate. That is not because carbohydrate is the main macronutrient that we can get from any kind of grain, cereals and different, different, you know, vegetables and all. Because if you talk about the RQ, RQ is the respiratory question, then we can see the carbohydrate respiratory question is one. Protein respiratory quotient is 0.8 and fat is 0.7. So if there is no carbohydrate, that will be interchangeably. Uh, there are some disruptions of the respiratory quotient. This is number one. And also we know variable about the ketone bodies because our brain knows only the glucose. Brain only, you know, imaging only the glucose part. So anything is very difficult to cross the blood brain barrier to go to the brain. So in that case is if you are not having the enough carbohydrates or enough cereals, then what happened the productions in the ketone bodies in the liver, maybe the acetone, maybe the, the acetoacetic acid. So a lot of ketone bodies are directly goes to, a, goes to our brain and lower pH means the ketoacidosis will happen. So ketoacidosis is a very common if you are not having the enough carbohydrates. So a lot of you know ketogenic diet, keto diet, intermittent fasting diet, low carbs diet are available but that should be under monitored with a clinical dietitian because alone only the helping of with the internet and the you know other televisions or anything we can't do alone unless and until we are taking getting the help from a qualified dietitian so that is very important and number two good quality protein protein should be a good quality because high biological value protein and also in our masters all we have calculated like the ndpkl percentage that is a very important thing, the chemical score, because we all know nitrogen comes from the protein. So low protein, again, negative nitrogen balance can happen because in, in diabetic nephropathy, uh, we have seen, we can say the low protein one means 40 gram, low protein two means 20 gram, but hardly we can able to make the protein. There are a lot of gaps in the protein. So protein should be there, but again, not too much of protein because there are a lot of people who are doing gene, who are doing other things, taking 300, 400 grams protein per day. Again, that will be 
problematic for the assimilations of that particular protein because we know very well that a term is called the osmotic diarrhea. If we can't uh, you know, assimilate the protein, that will be related to osmotic diarrhea, again it will be disbalance of the electrolyte disbalance. So protein should be properly calculated in like 1.2 to 1.5 gram per ideal kg body weight alone diabetes but there is a changes with the diabetic nephropathy, diabetic, uh, you know, um, uh, like, uh, what I will say, decompensated liver or any, uh, like, uh, NASH or any other, like, fatty, uh, fatty acids and all those things, like fatty liver and all those things, there's something different. Now, if we talk about the dietary fiber, then very good amount of the, is because our RDA says 40 grams of dietary fiber we have to take on daily basis. That is soluble dietary fiber and insoluble dietary fiber and diverse role for maintaining and managing diabetes and the other cholesterol pathways and all those things. And high monounsaturated fatty acid MOFA should be there because in that cases how we segregate about the fatty acid, if you say the single bonded, what the single, only the, uh, like there is a single bond, there is no double bond in the SAFA, that should be less than 7 percentage, any kind of solid fat less than 7 percentage. MUFA, like one double bond is spread in, that should be 10 to 15 percentage of any kind of oil. And PUFA, that should be less than 10 percentage, 7 to 10 percentage of any kind of oil, more than one double bond. And trans fatty acid, which are basically liquid in the room temperature through the hydrogenation process, we try to make it a solid. So that is the trans fatty acid, basically like any margarine, any vanishpati and all those things, a very classical example. And that should be very negligible from our daily diet because there are research says, a lot of PubMed index journal says, too much of trans fatty acid increases much more of LDL and atherosclerosis plaques in our body and leads to the, our, you know, the cholesterol metabolism and it's a different, uh, different scenario for the uh, like cardiometabolic disorder. So in that cases, we have tried to restrict the trans fatty acid. And carbohydrates, uh, you know, uh, should be spread evenly throughout the day because we try to make the carbohydrate thoroughly with the cereal, uh, from the cereals, from the, you know, uh, green leafy vegetables, from the vegetables, from any kind of sources, we try to set it on daily basis and incorporating micronutrients to better outcome because sometimes we try to forget about the micronutrient because zinc, selenium, chromium, vitamin D, all are very important micronutrients that we always try to follow in the diabetes because our research says the range from 58 to 63 percent from the vitamin B6 pyridoxine, 13 to 55 percent from the vitamin C and uh, 85 to 90 percent from vitamin D and 90 percent for the zinc so that we have to follow the proper the mineral because we try to maintain the mineral balance that's why we are trying to increase the mineral level. So we talk about the diabetes specific nutrition formula so we can get all those minerals. So we don't depend on any kind of vitamin capsule or mineral capsule so we can get directly from any kind of specific nutrition formula. These deficiency states are associated with the increase the oxidative stress, inflammations and immuno abnormalities and type diabetes medicine and beta cell dysfunction, lot of beta cell mass and signal impairment of the hyperinsulinemia. So in that cases oxidative stress are very important because if you talk about the TNF or any kind of cytokines because we know too much of cytokines and too much, too much of TNF basically increases the free fatty acid or fat oxidation or beta oxidation, omega oxidation because if we see the, gly the glucose part basically from after the pyruvic acid cycle like glycolysis cycle in the cytoplasm then directly they can go to the, our Krebs cycle. So Krebs cycle happens in the mitochondria First one in the acid, uh, like acetyl, uh, first one is the, uh, like, uh, uh, the, you, you know, the first part basically the uh, acid acetic acid and also the melanin coa, coa, coa and succinyl coa and we try to maintain this part to increases lot more of cytochrome, cytochrome A, cytochrome B to push it to the electron transport system chain. So basically this will happen only if we have this kind of diet. But if it doesn't have, then what will happen? This kind of, you know, the glucose, they're entering the hepatogenous pathway. And they, what will do? They are going for the de novo, de novo synthesis for the fatty acid. And after that, they're increasing the melanin quay, saxonin quay, palmitic acid, and mono dye, and the triglycerol and triglyceride. So triglyceride depositions will be there. So we shouldn't allow either to go to the de novo synthesis pathway 
or to the mavonolate pathway. So mavonolate pathway again responsible for the cholesterol mechanism. So in that case, we try to restrict. So not too much of the free fatty oxidation, too much of cytokines that shouldn't be allowed. So diabetic uh, specific nutrition formula, again, the same thing is uh, saying this important macronutrients, micronutrients in clinical practice that we are not, we are taking care of for the management of the diabetes mellitus. So this uh, diabetes specific nutrition formula, basically what I told you before also low GI, like low glycemic index and also the low glycemic load. Nowadays we are talking about too much of glycemic load because glycemic GI basically we can do the ranking of the carbohydrates and glycemic load basically we can get the carbohydrate amount percentage maybe apple glycemic index is a little higher but if we calculate the glycemic load is near about six to seven is a low, low glycemic load so we try to increase of this kind of uh, thing to our patient and also there are there are a lot of what the challenges basically for the patient in the evening snacks or the second meal basically second meal they are facing too much of challenges either they depend on the outer dietary food sources because we know a lot of restaurants lot of the food stuffs are available and too much frying of any kind of you know uh, foods or any kind of you know like vegetables or whatever are increases the free radical a lot of free radical basically incre increases the reactive oxygen species and that can lead to the any non communicable disease either diabetes obesity cardiovascular diseases ca and lot of things so there are there are the specific role of the antioxidant and flavonoids to cut and to seize and to basically control of in increasing the free radical. So too much of fat or too much of you know frying or too much of the outside foods shouldn't be allowed for a diabetic patient. So this formula again the hypercaloric meal, snack treatment, uh, hypercaloric supplementations for the malnourished patient, enteral nutrition support. So if you talk about the enteral nutrition support, so basically enteral nutrition means through the mouth or through the uh, rice tube feeding. So both the way in nutrition, but if we talk about the rice tube management patients, so there, there should be some formula, a peptide based or oligomeric formula that would be good, uh, good for the absorption or good for you know the their metabolisms and absorption path because we know the lot of absorption pathway like GLAT pathway, GLAT1, GLAT2, GLAT3, GLAT4, different pathways are there so that are helpful for the patient and a, avoid for any nosocomial infection in the hospital stage. So that will be different formulas are there. So standard formula basically rapidly digested carbohydrate with varying fat content therefore compressing the glycemic control already said before. So what does research to say? There are a lot of research says like diabetic specific formula improvements in the postprandial glycemic responses translating into the substance benefits in the long term glycemic control and glycemic variability in the various cardio metabolic outcomes. So there is a Norna et al 2022 a paper being published. So this is the actual research paper. What did they mean to say about the control of the diabetes mellitus? Now, what is the second mill effect? So second mill effect was first coined in 1982 by Dr. David J. Jenkins of University of Toronto. The concept of the second mill effect is a phenomenon with the glycemic index is one meal can influence the glycemic response to a subsequent meal. So if we consider about the second meal, we can see the glucose peak or the glycemic control peak one after another meal is very low. It's very low because that should be properly, they have to take the proper breakfast. So after breakfast, the meal and also the other meal is called the second meal. The second meal, once we get the second meal, so definitely the glycemic peak are very low. The sugar is being controlled. Why, why this phenomenon is basically is coming up? Because in that case, what we can, what we can see, then if we take a lot of good amount of the dietary fiber, lot of good amount of the low glycemic index and low glycemic food or low glycemic load food, then what will happen? Basically, the gastric emptying will happen. If the gastric emptying will happen, there is slow digestion. Slow digestion from the stomach to the small intestine. And we can say the upper part, the first part from the you know the small intestine they are basically they are secreting the GIP so GIP basically the glucose depend dependent the pancreatopy this uh, you know the uh, uh, like insulinotropic the polypeptide so GIP is there and followed by the last uh, you know you know past of the uh, you know intestine they are secreting the GLP1 like glucagonic polypeptide 1 and they are controlling the glucagon and they are 
basically you know increasing the insulin secretion they are basically controlling the glycemic response and they are basically controlling the food satiety so that will be really helpful for managing of the glycemic control and diabetes parameters. so this is the basically a function for taking a second meal and that should be getting from a good dietary sources i'm coming to that what, what part is basically the good for the second meal management again this concept basically we are coined from the foreign like standard shock effect and meal effect the phenomenon where the gi is one meal is influence on the glycemic response of the next meal a meal with a low glycemic index is lower postprandial glycemic response during the first meal compared of the uh, uh, you know the lower the glycemic response to a standard second meal so this is the second meal effect in the patient we have coined and we are maintaining this second meal effect with the patients for glycemic control now what is the diet disparities in india basically indians either have the high carbohydrate or the high fat diet so if we taking off too much of carbohydrate again i am saying hyperphagic or binge eating is not recommended okay there should be if we follow the chrono nutrition what is chrono nutrition basically chrono nutrition basically with the proper biological clock and our circadian rhythm starting from the early morning to breakfast to mid morning to lunch to evening supper followed by a dinner this is the this is basically the fund of the chrono nutrition because our bmr and rmr are active so bmr in the morning time is hyperactive once the you know the time comes down like 10 pm 11 pm if you take the dinner so bmr is very lower it will be chances to your obesity because this will be again increasing of your ghrelin hormone and that could be increasing lot of your appetite and that will be again is is your disproportions of your uh, like abdominal fat your visceral fat your uh, like obesity and again uh, this obesity basically to the insulin resistance and it will be uh, again a detrimental for us so high carbohydrate and high fat it shouldn't be recommended yeah. so that that shouldn't be recommended an average calorie intake per day is 2169 to 2214 is less than the one reference like 2500 calorie around half of the daily calories are derived from the carbohydrates only the 7% of the calorie are derived from the protein because the protein ratio is very rare so in that cases if the protein ratio is very rare there are lot of you know chances of the protein deficiency there are lot of chances with low amino acids and if lot of chances with like tissue breakdown the muscle breakdown negative nitrogen balance so this can happen so protein should be in a proper in a higher way in that cases but our indian scenario hardly we can meet the protein part so again this is the picture like 64.1% total carbohydrate provided uh, you know by the carbohydrates and also the total energy intake was obtained from the protein and the fats are accounted for 20, 21.5% of the total energy intake so this is the again our dietary disparities what we can say 60% we can take from the carbohydrate 20% we can get from the protein and 20% we should get from the fat but again disparities in our population because because in the uh, the you know what about the challenges are there we always try to follow the either the idf like international diabetes federation or the american diabetes association ada guideline so hardly we can follow any indian guideline so indian guideline should be there that we can follow because in a western countries they have been lot of protein lot of protein but in our countries we have taken lot of carbohydrates because in that cases there will be a small amount of rice lot of chicken lot of eggs and all those things but in our state what we will do lot of rice is with one piece of chicken or one piece of fish again this will capture as a dietary disparities so it will be again calculating we are not properly maintaining our diet what happened because if we go back in our covid days i think second phase of covid we all were hearing about the oxygen nahi mil raha hai there are lot of you know scarcity of the oxygen getting why it was happening because in that cases all the people are getting the lockdown over there and during the lockdown lot of third party apps we are getting a lot of orders of the food we are sitting in the home we are sitting in our room are having lot of food all together 
if if you taking lot of food all together what will happen the happening is that because our lungs capacity is very less so lot of food like too much of food for metabolize for making this proper bmr level to the rq so the carbon dioxide generation is much higher so if the carbon dioxide can't stay in your lungs it will be spread in our blood stream so then oxygen scarcity was there so that's why high perfect if you take two plate of three plates of biryani what will happen we are sweating and we are having you know lot of problematic like we need some water for dilutions and everything because this is called the hyperfatic so we shouldn't take too much of food altogether due to this rq due to this bmr and all those things a small frequent meal should be there so that's why binge eating is not suggested at any point of view now on is the snacking so more than 50% of the all people will type 2 diabetes mellitus consume snacks at least twice a week increase the risk of the poor glycemic control and obesity due to the raised of the blood glucose level so this is again a poor blood glucose control because we having lot of you know unhealthy snacks unhealthy snacks habituated unhealthy snack because you know once in a blue moon once in a fortnight is okay because we are a social human being we have to follow any kind of decorum or any kind of you know gathering something like that but if you make it a regular habituated wise what how it's happen because again uh, uh, i'm saying any kind of food what we what we try to tend to have eat to a particular any kind of food at any given point of time so our mind should be there after having this particular food we try to make this food to energy so we can't direct to our uh, go to the energy no it's no so we try to restrict cross the de novo synthesis pathway cross the mevalonate pathway the cholesterol pathway so basically our motto is that this after the krebs cycle increasing the atp and also the cytochrome a and b to goes to our the electron transport system chain to for the formations of the energy so food should be converted into energy not should be deposited to our adipose tissues number 1 not should go for the fatty acid synthesis to de novo synthesis like hepatogenous diabetes no it, it, it shouldn't be our goal and neither to the mevalonate pathway to increase in the cholesterol ldl level because we all know the drug about statin what the statin is called hmg coa reductase so hmg coa is one kind of a pathway mechanism that can increases the cholesterol level so that's why the reductase medicines is there to see the particular path and we are control that is the drug interaction but from the food why shouldn't we encourage to have this particular food so owner should be asked to encourage on to to us to our friends and also our respected patients or clients so consequences of the unhealthy snacking postprandial hyperglycemia promote insulin resistance and inflammatory responses lead to hyperglycemia with consume at night time so in night time the hyperglycemia happens so we all know about the dawn phenomenon and the somogi effect so what happened there is somogi effect 3 am overnight the hypoglycemia shocks happen and in the morning at 5 5 am the blood sugar level spikes up this is the somogi and dawn is basically again the 3 am hypoglycemia but after breakfast 1 to 2 hours after breakfast the blood sugar spikes up so this we have to control because the challenges what we face if a patient is on insulin it may be human mixture maybe other insulin so these challenges we are facing so accordingly we have to calculate our diet prescription the calorie timing not we are giving too much of carbohydrates in overnight because it will be again detrimental for the dawn phenomenon so that should be a very limited and that should be with a calorie calculated not overfeeding during overnight because there's a cravings is much more higher because what 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 cravings is there because there are a lot of because one a patient is on diabetes maybe he or she has other comorbid infection maybe he or she is suffering from hypertension maybe he or she is suffering from any like uh, what i will say depression any other problem like insomnia so they are opted for having the ssri selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors this kind of drugs or any mao inhibitors so what happen after this selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors of mao inhibitors the cravings of carbohydrates is much more higher 
because our brain there releases the serotonin serotonin dopamine thromotonin all those neurotransmitters hormone the chemicals because what happened to our neuron neuron are taking lot of serotonin if neuron is taking lot of serotonin our brain lacks of serotonin so low serotonin means low mood depression uh, you know there are the uh, insomnia lot of problem lot of you know like panic disorder panic order lot of you know things can happen but low level of serotonin now again i have said you know fast very fast that bbb blood brain barrier is very difficult to cross so if the blood brain barrier is difficult to cross so serotonin maybe after having chocolate after having something we can increase our serotonin level but there should need an amino acid that can helps to reach the blood brain barrier crossing the blood brain barrier limit to go to serotonin that is called basically they are the tryptophan so tryptophan basically we are getting from the omega 3 fatty acid fish oil from the eggs from the milk from, from any kind of sources so this can help to increase our mood to you know feel good factor and also we are very much happy after having this thing but drugs are there again and again i am saying any kind of allopathic medicines are definitely good because they are directly goes to this pathway and walking spontaneously but there are lot of adverse events there are lot of adverse events of any kind of drug you must have heard, i have told you after having sulfonylurea they are getting a little bit of weight gain like one or two kg of weight gain but after having any kind of drugs like any kind of ssri or any kind of you know uh, mau inhibitors you can see there are, are the angioedema there are the too much of you know swelling face too much of body overweight or obesity can happen this is basically happens for the drug induced obesity this drug induced obesity you can get it either from any ssri or mau inhibitors or from any like glucocorticoids or any kind of mineral corticoids like you know very well that prednisolone vysolone this kind of steroid drugs so steroid induced obesity is very common during our covid days you must have heard the patient was not diabetic but on that cases they are having some steroid uh, uh, like drugs or steroid medicines that can increases the obesity so there lot of lot of things happening for the obesity and diabetes so that's why the practices of the unhealthy snacks practices of the unhealthy meal it shouldn't be recommended to anyone okay and also the alcohol part also there may be lot of guidelines and books are there there this percentage of alcohol you can take but if you say this percentage they will hardly bother you they can take daily one or two cups of alcohol so that shouldn't be there now mechanism underlying of the second meal effect number one the fasting free fatty acid may be a key part of the second meal effect so we try to restrict the free fatty acid so we we have to control the cytokines we have to control the intake of lot of fats lot of carbohydrate and try to restrict try to restrict the pathways the pathways of the you know you know uh, the like mevalonate pathway and the dino synthesis that too much of fatty acid because you know there were very fat concept that too much of fried food can increases the triglyceride level no triglyceride basically related with the glucose part so it, that's why the hepatogenous diabetes is very common because too much of glucose they are going to the de novo synthesis pathway the beta oxidations and omega oxidation they are increasing the triglyceride like mono di and the triglyceride mean triglyceride so in that cases we try to restrict the free fatty acids and the insulin release after low glycemic index suffers the free fatty acid concentration increases insulin action and reduces the glyco glycogen storage so we try to restrict to liver to increase as much more of glucose so glucose production should be limited glucose production should be limited only bicarbonate does but through the diet pattern also we are not recommending too much of the glucose too much of the sucrose too much of the fructose again some people says fructose are good but sometimes fructose again gives an detrimental effect for increasing the dino synthesis pathway so that should be there levels of cytokines have also been implicated in second meal effect because cytokines basically are friend full with the glucagon with the acth like adrenocorticotrophic hormone and with the other 
hormones basically other growth hormone gh hormone that basically increases the glucagon level and suppresses the insulin level but our motto is increases the insulin level and suppresses to reduce the glucagon level so we should avoid the cytokines and other things and low glycemic load meals produce higher levels of the glp1 il6 and the glp1 have been shown to reduce the gastric enzyme what i have said because these basically the glucose induced or glucose insulinotropic polypeptide the gip are secreting from the upper part of the small intestine are basically increasing the insulin secretion and gip basically uh, glp basically the uh, uh, glucagon like peptide one are secreting from the parietal or the lower side of the small intestine are controlling the diabetes or the hypo, hyperglycemia so in that cases our main motto to induce or to uh, you know encourage people to have lot of low glycemic load and low glycemic index food and fruits and vegetables colonic fermentations of the food such as fiber and legumes may also contribute to a low glycemic response for the second meal effect by decreasing the ffa level because we talk about lente carbohydrates we talk about the resistant maltodextrin i am not talking about the maltodextrin resistant maltodextrin basically is a one kind of a maltodextrin that can't digest in our small intestine unlike others they can't digest in the small intestine what will happen they directly goes to our large intestine and the large colon part in the case from the colonic epithelium the fermentation process they are working with the short chain fatty acids like butyrate short chain fatty acid with the colonic epithelium the different gene expressions are there and they are increasing lot of fructose oligosaccharides and fructose oligosaccharides are working with the probiotic like bifidobacterium or lactobacillus and they are working as a symbiotics and maintaining the glycemic control because gastric emptying is there and they can maintain as a symbiotics to the glycemic control maybe you can say that lot of butyrate you know lot of you know uh, like uh, like this kind of free fatty acid can formations of the flatulence or gas but resistant maltodextrin have a chance of the low hydrogen low methane that's why the flatulence of gas formation is very minimal so in that case this is a again a good tool for maintaining the glycemic control and for the low glycemic status now second meal effects the low gi foods again and again, again we are talking about the low gi and the low gl control the postprandial blood glucose level because you have to remember the second meal basically we are talking about the postprandial but not the fasting part and control the blood glucose levels of the subsequent meal so what the benefits of the high protein food here one like in this graph basically is the one part they are having the intact whey whey protein one part is having the hydrolyzed whey protein but where you if you see the basically the green shaded they are indicates and the blue shaded the area indicates is the whey protein so what will happen if we see the intact whey protein they can control much more higher glycemic control why because hydrolyzed whey protein is very fast release so we are something having very slow release so we are not going to any kind of fast release so slow release any kind of whey protein can improve the glycemic control not the fast release that's why we shouldn't go for the hydrolyzed whey protein we can go for the intact only whey protein that can giving us slow release and so slow progression are basically maintaining the diabetes mellitus and the glycemic control low gi carbohydrates is the basically the isomaltulose now what is isomaltulose isomaltulose is same like sucrose basically this is also a disaccharide but the major like distinguishes between a sucrose and the isomaltose because basically isomaltose instead of the alpha 1 Two, uh, like their glycosidic bond, they are having the one six glycosidic bond. Instead of the one two glycosidic bond, they are having the alpha one six glycosidic bond, and they are basically slow absorption than the sucrose. Then isomaltase, isomaltase are walking very slow rather than the sucrose. So in that cases, 
Isomaltose is far, far, far better. Why? Because it can, it can control our first the GIP, then the GLP-1 and controlling our blood sugar level is very, very far better than sucrose. But sucrose again gives a detrimental health adverse events for the diabetes patient unlike isomaltulose. So isomaltulose is basically goes with the second meal effect for controlling the diabetes mellitus and the glycemic control. Soluble fiber resistant dextrin, resistant dextrin being resistant maltodextrin that is something different with the normal maltodextrin and the fructo oligosaccharide decreases level of the serum cholesterol level stimulates the growth of the friendly bacteria because we all, all know very well the bile acid and the cholesterol are very good combination. So these dietary fiber, they are basically not binding with our blood cholesterol level. They are trying to leach out through our large intestine due to the help, helpful mechanism of the soluble dietary fiber. If you give the example like pectin, like guar gum, a very classical example from the soluble dietary fiber stimulates the growth of the friendly bacteria because any kind of colonic epithelium they needs good bacteria so that's why bifidobacterium lactobacillus so all those things are very good bacteria and this colonic epithelium uh, this fructo oligosaccharide and this maltodextrin and also the probiotics working as a symbiotics and controlling the diabetes control improves mineral absorption like calcium and prevents constipations like Unlike the European country, they are basically suffering from the diverticulosis and all those things. But in our state, we are having, uh, you know, a lot of cellulose, hemicellulose, a lot of, you know, kind of this kind of insoluble dietary fiber helpful for you in our bulk movement of the stool. So in that cases, we can reduce constipation and reduce any kind of diverticulosis or any kind of colon cancer level. So that's why, that's why our main objective to encourage lot of seasonal vegetables, seasonal fruits, local vegetable, local fruits, instead of taking any fruits from the outside country. Role of vitamins, minerals are very important. Boosters like micronutrients like uh, uh, vitamin B1 is a very good micronutrient, B2, B6, B12, copper, manganese and iodine contribute to a normal energy yielding metabolism. Immune health like micronutrient, folic acid, support normal function, immune health, have significant positive impact of the glucose metabolism, this decreased risk of the type 2 diabetes and also the worse and diverse all of the antioxidants. So if you talk about the antioxidant, we can get the hasperidin, narnigen from the vitamin C like any kind of fruits. We can get nasonin from the brinjal. We can get lycopene from the tomato or red capsicum, red bell pepper. We can get very good amount of isoflavin, genistein or phytoestrogen from soybean. We can get very good amount of allylic sulfide from garlic. We can get ginger oil from ginger. We can get catechins from the tea. Epigalitocatechin, green tea predominantly. But again, green tea is not always good. The combination of the green tea, tomato and the lemon is a great combination for increasing the calculi like kidney stone or either the gallbladder stone because this is forming the oxalate and oxalate are responsible for the stool formation that's why after having one cup of green, green tea immediately we have to consume three glass of water otherwise this amount of green tea to form the oxalate we can increase we can retain a lot of tannic acid tannin caffeine all the non-nutrient part and we we can't retain or detain uh, preferably the important volatile oils and the antioxidants so role of antioxidant again a diverse role for reducing the ROS reactive oxygen species reduces the free radical formation good for the syndrome X and also the non-communicable diseases like diabetes cardiovascular hyperlipidemia, dyslipidemia, CA and all also other things. It's all in the second bracket we can see the syndromics. So educating patients on the concept of the second meal effect helps control blood glucose levels in the healthy individual and reduce the risk of the metabolic disorders number one. Support change towards the lower glycemic load meals especially before bed. So try to go for the lower glycemic load or lower glycemic index food because two or three things because hyperphagicity for cut down hyperphagicity to increase the GIP, GLP-1 because 
you know there is a one example i have given during the examination the school days what the parents does they are carrying the ors for their children so what is formula is 1 liter of water with 4 spoon of sugar and with 1 spoon 1 teaspoon of salt so they are having 1 liter of water with 8 to 10 you know tablespoon of sugar one pinch of salt what will happen too much of glucose basically you know that there are some hglt like sodium glucose transporters are there so what will happen the persons are getting synco or faint why because too much of glucose aggravate the sodium transporter pathway the GLUT pathway and different microvilli or villi if you talk about the absorptions of the glucose it's happened so we have to follow the proper who recommendation ors level otherwise this ors the oral dehydration solution and salt go for the oral dehydration solution so in the, that cases there should be proper maintaining the salt and the solution should be there encourage consumptions of the food high in fiber such as whole grain legumes to help reduce postprandial glucose response again whole grain why is important because we can break the endosperm part of the whole grains instead of having the refined cereals refined rice or maida we can introduce lot of atta whole wheat atta nowadays millets are very popular Millets, are, I think hope Mondi will agree with me because a few days that Mondi was a given lecture, millet, it was awesome. So millet is a very healthy, you know, forms of the food groups in our country, we try to encourage. Okay, because Jowar, Bajra, Ragi, a lot of other, this is a major part of the millet, but there are a lot of subgroups of millets are there, we try to encourage. Okay. And aid in weight loss, improve CVD outcomes and stuff like this. Because weight loss, why I'm saying because dia obesity is very common. Very common because there are white adipose tissue. Because white adipose tissue should be there. White adipose tissue is controlling the leptin hormone mechanism. Because too much of leptin hormone basically reduces the fat absorption. Leptin basically increases the energy. Because leptin basically okay i am full but ghrelin no i am not full ghrelin is always active for having the food grabbing so we try to reduce the ghrelin and increases the leptin hormone that's why obesity weight control and the central obesity part the tummy part the visceral part the abdominal part because in the muac scale and all the scale we try to maintain the waist circumference the hip circumference this is very 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 important so obesity shouldn't be there in the higher class Otherwise, it could be maintained. We can't maintain the proper diabetes. The glucagon secretions is again higher. Their insulin resistance will be there. Glycemic control can't be happening. Outcomes and type of diabetes management should be there if we control the proper, you know, diet, proper dietary regimen to listen and adhere and compliance with therapy. What the clinical dietitian says about the diet prescription encourage a lot of second meal effect to wow the second meal effect because uh, uh, they have some uh, uh, prohens have some biscuits they have the isomaltulose they're increasing the isomaltulose that is considered the same functional formula and apart from that there are good amount of dietary fiber a lot of uh, micronutrients macronutrients protein as they are and absolutely a good snack replacers so that's all from my side thank you so much for your patient listening any questions from your side? Now this is an open session for the questions.